test. And, and that's been through the roof. Wow, great. I'll send it to you. And you may have, I may have missed it. It sounds vaguely familiar. All right, hello, hello everyone. Um, please remember to um, keep yourselves on mute. Uh, there will be some opportunity to ask questions at the end, but I would suggest as we're going along, if you'd like to pose questions, please put them in the chat box. That'll be the best way of communicating. Uh, I think there will be a fair number of people on this call. Um, I'm not quite starting, but I think most of you know me, but some of you don't. I am Lawrence Davis Hollander, and I am the program coordinator for the Scoville Memorial Library. So welcome to the Scoville Memorial Library. And um, I think probably you can see there is our speaker, Mark Plotkin, but before we get to him, I'm gonna do a little bit of talking and uh, wait another minute or two just to admit a few more people into the room. Um, and uh, actually there is a link that I put uh, in the chat box already, which is a link to a program. Mark could probably tell you more about it than me. I know he can, uh, but it's a program that his organization has put together uh, about a descendant African community in Suriname uh, and the mapping and oral history and preservation of some of their ways. And uh, that will be tomorrow. Um, presented live on Facebook. Um, nothing there, Dan says. Well, hmm. Well, it'll be live tomorrow on Facebook. <laughs> and you can go to the Amazon Conservation Team website and I think you can find it. I'm not quite sure why it is not posted there. It's on our Facebook page. And their Facebook page. All right, I think I will start now. We've got a fair number of attendees um, and people will filter in. Uh, really pleased to have Mark with us. Um, I can give you Mark's long, long bio. He's uh, done many great things. Uh, started the Amazon Conservation Team and in the directorships of other or senior positions at other conservation organizations. Um, he went to Harvard and Yale Forestry and got his PhD from Tufts, uh, prolific writer, he's been on YouTube and um, all kinds of things. But I know Mark and I know Mark pretty well and it's not about the adulation for Mark. Um, that's merely a vehicle to get the, <laughs> that's a vehicle to get the message out. Uh, so Mark and I go back a long time. I've known Mark for 40 years, it's a little hard to believe. And um, the, the intersection, the commonality was at Harvard University where we both uh, worked with um, a renowned professor now deceased, Richard Evans Schultes. Um, and Mark knows the drill. So uh, you may be wondering why am I diverting from talking about Mark? Well, talking about Richard Evans Schultes is talking about Mark. Um, and um, I'm not gonna spend a long time talking about him, but he was a, a remarkable man. We really saw him, met him, worked with him at his sort of twilight of his teaching career. Um, he spent 15 years more or less continuously in the Amazon. Uh, he's, many people consider him the last of the Victorian plant explorers, but I would say he's really the first of the modern ethnobotanists. And, and I say that because he recognized something in the Indians, the people he worked with, that their extensive plant knowledge that went back thousands and thousands of years. And he realized that they knew far more than any uh, pharmaceutical company. And, um, and it wasn't just about medicinal plants, but their, their knowledge base and their ways and so forth were extraordinary. And it's extraordinary that Schultes recognized this because we're talking about late 30s, 40s, 50s, when Indians and people of color were not exactly looked at as authorities. And he recognized that and his love for those people, his love for his students, and you could always bother him almost any time, um, 
his passion um, was just incredible and infectious. And um, that passion was um, passed on in particular here to Mark. Uh, and, and I would say Mark really is, of all his students, at least in my estimation, one of the ones that truly carries the mantle of Richard Evan Schultes. And, um, and Marx expanded on that, modernized certain things and so forth. Uh, Schultes led the way and I think Marx created some new pathways for that. And, um, but that uh, infectious appreciation of the people, their ways, their understanding, Marx has carried through and his love for the Amazon, those people, is quite apparent. And I think if you've not heard Mark talk before, you will find out in a minute or two of what, of what I'm speaking. So with that, I will let Mark take it away. Thank you, Lawrence. It's great to be here. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thanks for agreeing to spend a little bit of time together this evening. I am uh, proud of the fact that I'm a library nerd, grew up in libraries, still spend every spare moment in libraries reading real books, not electronic stuff. So it's always good to be with fellow, uh, fellow book lovers. Now, I wanna talk a bit about uh, my work in the Amazon as Lawrence introduced it. Uh, what I am involved in is something we call biocultural conservation. When I started working at the World Wildlife Fund in 1981, they were an organization that focused on saving plants and animals. And then you had groups like Lawrence and I knew at Harvard, cultural survival, they focused on indigenous peoples. But I quickly realized through the guidance of Professor Schultes, you couldn't protect the forest if you didn't empower the indigenous peoples, and you couldn't protect the indigenous peoples unless you protected the forest. So it's rather a holistic approach, which is what Professor Schultes always championed. So I wanna show you a few pictures, then I'm gonna talk about some of the books that are written for further background. And I'm certainly hoping to leave you with more questions and answers, because to me, that to me is the mark of a memorable lecture. So Lawrence, could we have the first slide, please? We gotta to go to the top. That's the middle. Oh, whoa, whoa. now where'd we go? Oh. Sorry about that. How That's okay. Get... So I've just come out with a new book. It's called The Amazon, What Everybody Needs to Know. And it's an overview of Amazonia that talks about everything from the geology to the ethnobotany, to the conservation, to the use of hallucinogenic plants. So did that's the first one, Mark? In the, one more, go back one more. That's the Jaguar Shaman, my first teacher in the Northeast Amazon, 1982. And this is the man, and this is the story that kicks off my first book, Tales for Shaman's Apprentice. And I'm not going to tell you that story because uh, it's worth reading in the book. Next. But he was my entry into the shamanic world into the understanding that these people have different ways of knowing. And it was Professor Schultes who said to Lawrence and me and all of his other students and acolytes that these people, these unlettered people, these so-called primitive people who can't write their, their, their first name and don't have a last name, no more about the professors, the Yale professors or Cambridge professors or Oxford professors. And I think we all took that to heart. Next. So I started in the Northeast Amazon on the border between Suriname and Brazil, a really forgotten part of Amazonia. And what I found, there were 13 different tribes, none of which had ever been studied for their ethnobotany, that is the study of how people relate to plants and the knowledge thereof. This is my YY guide showing me a plant they used to make curare. Now curare is arrow poison. Curare has been important in, in Western medicine as a muscle relaxant. But what we found out was that these indigenous peoples use these non-toxic plants as part of their poison. These are admixtures. And it doesn't make sense from a Western uh, perspective. Why are you putting in this stuff that's not poisonous to make an arrow poison? It's been dismissed as mumbo jumbo. And recent chemical analysis revealed that these plants, which are not toxic, as I said, potentiate complex chemical reactions. In other words, they make the poison more poisonous. They enhance the blood's ability to absorb the poison, making the poison more poisonous. Now, how did these guys in breech cloths and, and penis strings figure this out when it took us 
you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years to realize they knew what we were, they were talking about and we did not. Next. And what I learned from Professor Schultes is really the basis of this type of work is uh, long-term relationships. And the mistake that Western scientists make in working with other cultures, and that could be the Trio Indians in the Amazon like you see here, it could be with wine peasants in the south of France, is you drop your grad student in, you say, okay, get lots of data, I'll be back for you nine months, and then come back to Connecticut, come back to Massachusetts, come back to Paris, and write your thesis. But the fact is, people will never tell you all of their secrets in nine months, especially if you just met them. It doesn't matter if, if you're in the US or the Amazon, it's human nature. And I've been working with these people in some cases almost four decades. And that is why I have learned as much as I've learned. And the most important thing I've learned is how much there is still to learn. Next. This is my friend Wuta, who was a trio hunter. He's now the most accomplished cartographer in the Amazon. He's the most accomplished map maker in the Amazon. When these Indians needed a map to get title to their lands, they asked me, they asked my organization, Amazon Conservation Team, www.amazonteam.org, to make them a map. And I said, we won't do it. And they said, but you promised to help. And I said, we will. And they said, well, then you'll make us a map. And I said, we won't. And the chief said, I'm confused. I said, we will help. We won't make a map. We'll teach you how to make your own maps. And Wuta was the very first indigenous cartographer in the Amazon basin. Next. This is the great shaman Natala. I worked with him for many decades and he is the protagonist of my children's book. I did a children's book about 15 years ago <coughs> called The Shaman's Apprentice with Lynn Sherry. Those of you who have kids and grandkids know her book, The Great Kapok Tree. It's the most popular kids book on the rainforest ever written. And Natala is the featured shaman in the book. Next. <coughs> This is my friend Yala Wifa, uh, one of the great shamans, one of, one of my first guides. Uh, he, and, he and I are still working together 38 years later. Next. And this is my favorite shaman of all. <coughs> this is a koi. When I got to South Suriname, all of the Indians spoke Sanantongo, which is a mixture of Amerindian, Portuguese, uh, Dutch, and Yiddish. And we're very close to the Brazilian border. And I said, does anybody speak Portuguese? So they went off and came back with this fellow. Oh, amigo, como vai tudo? And he actually speaks very good Portuguese. So we're chatting, chatting, and chatting. And he stops and he smiles. And he says, well, a white man, huh? He says, you know, I've killed about 20 of them in my time. But you seem to be rather an OK sort. So I, I, I just kind of smiled weakly. And I asked the local missionary if this was true. And he said, absolutely. He's not only killed many white men, he's even killed many Indians who've trespassed on his traditional lands. So I wanted to work with him. And he was very friendly, very warm, but he kept saying, I don't know anything about plants. I don't know anything about plants. I don't know anything about plants. And then in year 12, when I was working there, <coughs> I was working on skin diseases. Now, one of the ways you find out if, if, if a person or people know a disease is to show them a picture of it. So I had a dermatology textbook and, and was saying, okay, do you know this disease, do you know this disease, do you know this disease? And if they know it, they'll then have a name for it in their language. And then the trios, the dominant tribe there, they left five or six or seven plants to treat it. And so I had all the great trio shamans there and one gave me five plants and one gave me seven plants. And in comes a koi. Remember, he's a sick animal from a different tribe. So he's sitting there with this, this goofy grin. It was very distracting. I'm trying to you know, do research and write it down. He's got this goofy grin. And I said, well, why, why are you smiling? And he says, well, I know that disease. I'm showing a picture of Staph aureus infection. And uh, I said, do you have a name for it in your language? And he said, of course, we call it Mutaiga. And I said, Mutaiga, huh, you know how to treat it? And he said, sure. He said, I use this plant and this plant and this plant or 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 this plant. 18 plants. Now, the paramount shamans of the trios only know seven plants. This guy's got 18. 
So I said, how, how do you know so much? And he said, because I'm the paramount shaman. I know more than all these guys put together. And I said, but you spent 12 years telling me you weren't a shaman and you didn't know anything about medicinal plants. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. He leaned over, broke into a big smile, pushed his nose against my nose and said, I was just pulling your leg. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I've never played a practical joke on somebody that took over a decade to deliver the punchline. But this is what ethnobotanists call Indian time. And that's why being in a hurry, like all of us white people are compared to these guys, uh, we sometimes miss the boat. Next. This is another shaman. This is Amashina, who I think is the greatest shaman in all of Amazonia right now. And same thing, it took 15 years before he admitted he was a shaman. So you just can't do this research in a hurry. Now, if you fellow botany nerds out there like Lawrence, he's holding ganetum. Ganetum is a conifer, not an angiosperm. It's a conifer. It's, it's like a, an Amazonian pine tree. It's a liana. Lianas are woody vines. In my new book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know, I talk about the fact that lianas are about 30% of the ethnopharmacopoeia. In other words, one of every three plants indigenous peoples in the Amazon use is a liana. But here's the problem. Lianas are really, really, really difficult to work with. Why? Because they're climbing vines. Lianas are the woody vines that Tarzan swings on. That's a liana. And they flower in the treetops. So as a botanist, as a Western trained botanist, you've got to get stuff in fruit or flower. You can't identify it. Imagine this stuff, 51 weeks of the year, there is no fruit and there is no flower. And that one week where there's fruit or flowers, it's 100 feet up in, in the canopy. And when Schultes was looking for Yoko, one of the most powerful medicinal plants in Northwest Amazon, it took him seven years. He found it in flower. He had to cut down seven trees to get the vine. So this should give you a sense of how little we know about what's out there medicinally, because for 500 years, uh, nobody was collecting the vines, which is a third of their ethnopharmacopoeia. Next. Uh, this is my old friend, Aritana. Now, this is not the Northeast Amazon. This is the Southeast Amazon, uh, indigenous reserve called the Shingu. And we invented our mapping approach, which involved training them, the indigenous peoples make the map, and then the trainers train the next trainers. In other words, we move the, uh, we move the indigenous cartographers over to the next village. And the Shinguanos heard about our efforts and invited us down there. And this is the completion of the first map in the Shingu. And Aritano is the paramount chief. I'm presenting him with the map. And here's the bad news. Aritano died of COVID uh, last month. So COVID COVID has killed a lot of really important uh, indigenous leaders in the Amazon, uh, totally unreported in the US press. If you go to a site called Manga Bay, M O N G A B A Y.com, it's the best rainforest site. You should really bookmark it. And one of the reasons I wrote the new book for Oxford Press was because so many books on the Amazon are dreck. It's written by people who've never been in the Amazon, uh, went to the Amazon once, and copying other books on the Amazon, which were wrong to begin with. So uh, Manga Bay is my go-to site. I've been working on rainforest 40 some odd years and Manga Bay is the place to go. And, and, and when Aritana died, along with another one of my best friends from the Kogi tribe, I wrote an obituary and wrote a piece called uh, COVID is Killing Indigenous Leaders. So perhaps I can send the reference to Lawrence and he can share it with you, talking about this essentially unknown tragedy uh, that's going on under our noses. Next. Sorry, Mark. There. Yeah. Okay. These are two of the trios. Remember the trios are the dominant tribe in the Northeast Amazon. And I started my work on the Suriname side of the border. And the fellow in the middle about 20 years ago, left and moved across the border into Brazil for a variety of reasons. And the fellow next to him on the right side 
is his brother who had left earlier for Brazil, but I had met him in, in, in 1982. And so there was a gathering of, of the tribal chiefs and the shamans about two years ago, to which I was invited. It took me four days to get there from Brasilia. Okay, we're not talking about four days from, from DC or from Boston. I mean, this is one of the most remote villages in the world. It took me four days to get there. And the chief in the middle was the host of the conference, and he was the one who invited me. It was really amazing. I mean, this handwritten note that got paddled out by a canoe and then narrated over the radio and then transcribed. It, 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 it reminded me of that great scene in Star Wars where, you know, it's like, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, in a hologram. Uh, anyhow, I went there to the conference, and lo and behold, the fellow on the right shows up, who I hadn't seen in quite some time, and he looked at me and he said, you were my father's friend. He said, I haven't seen you in 32 years. I heard you were going to be here. I walked five days to see you. He said, can I give you a hug? That's the kind of long-term relationship that makes ethnobotany successful. Next. And this is something I'm exceptionally proud of. It was a bestseller amongst the seven people who care about this stuff, the Lianas of the Guianas. 15 years of collecting the Lianas of Suriname, Guyana, uh, French Guiana, because you got to sit under that tree 100 feet down and wait for the flowers, the fruit to drop. You got to have somebody climb up the tree and pull it down so you can take a picture. So this is a real labor of love, but it is. Uh, available fellow plant lovers. And we did something different. We didn't make it a scientific publication with line drawings. And we didn't make it a coffee table book with uh, beautiful pictures and no science. We tried to combine the two. And so it's something of which we're exceptionally proud. It's one of the most important books ever written on the Amazon. And it's a coffee table book. So those of you who love plants, love the rainforest, uh, please check this out. Next. And this is me with Amashina uh, 30 years after we met. And like I said, uh, it takes time. This is my friend Kamanya. My first book, Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice, is in the 40th printing. It's one of, if not the most popular book ever written on the Amazon. And the, 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 the title is a trick because people think that I became the Shaman's Apprentice. But the trick was that by having the young guys work with me, who had no interest in this stuff, they learned all the stuff from the great shamans. And then by the end of the work, eight years in, they knew as much as any shaman. So this is the shaman's apprentice, the first one, Kamanya. Because at the end of the work, of the first phase at least, we had the new generation of shamans, of which Kamanya has become uh, the most famous. Next. This is us starting out in 1984. So, uh, I, I showed this picture to a, a friend of mine, and she said, when you go back, take the same pose uh, 34 years later. Next. And I showed it to her, and she said, well, your notebook's gotten a lot bigger. Can you go back one? And I said, yeah, you know, over time, as the brain shrinks, the notebook has to get bigger. Next. Next. And here's the man we started out with, uh, Professor Schultes, who was a great scientist, uh, a great humanist, a great ethnobotanist, and had one of the greatest senses of humor uh, of anyone I've ever met. I I'm convinced that one of the ways that, that Schultes won these people's uh, fondness and friendship was he just, he was just so damn funny. Here he is in the the, the uh, Sibandoy Valley, which we call the Valley of the Hallucinogens. The fellow on the left with the feathers is Salvador Chindoy. He is the one who taught Schultes ayahuasca. Uh, and Schultes is the one who brought it to the Western world. So we call Salvador Chindoy the, the first shaman. There's been a big debate in ethnobotany circles over whether Schultes ever really experienced this stuff. He said, you know, I drank a lot of ayahuasca, but it, it never had any effect on me. And, and Lawrence and I heard him tell this to journalists for years, and they would come away, come away uh, very disappointed because they want to find out that this man was stripping his brains out. And he'd always say, well, you know, I mean, I, I saw some colors, that was about it. 
Well, I was in Bogota about five or six years ago. Uh, Schultes had passed away years before. And I was talking to one of Schultes' uh, closest Colombian colleagues, a, a famous botanist named Jesus Hidrobo. But more importantly, his Schultes' old field assistant from the Sibandoy Pedro, where he had just been there. And I asked Hidrobo about this. And he said, right where you're sitting, right in that chair you're sitting in Bogota, Colombia, was Pedro Wahibioy a few nights ago. And I asked him the same question. And he said, I was there the night my uncle Salvador Chindoy gave Ricardo ayahuasca for the first time. I said, wow, Eureka. How was it? He says, he laughed and sang the entire night, totally putting paid to this published story that Schultes never felt the effects of ayahuasca. So I got really excited. And I, and I said, he, he, he laughed and he sang and he told stories all night. What did he say? And he said, Pedro looked at me and shook his head and said, we don't know. It was all in English. Next slide, please. And this was one of the great shamans still practicing, one of the great ayahuasca shamans. And I actually brought him to Los Angeles to talk to a foundation about getting some support because the Amazon conservation team, my group, has worked with the local people to map the whole valley. It's the headwaters of the Putumayo River, one of the major uh, rivers that flow into the Amazon. And the program officer of the foundation, who was actually quite a jerk, but spoke Spanish rather well, said, can I ask the shaman a question? I said, sure. And he said to the shaman, he said, you're a medicine man, right? And he said, yes, people say that I am. And he said, well, you didn't go to medical school, right? And the shaman said, no, of course not, I'm a medicine man. And he said, well, then what could you know about medicine? I was just stunned at his stupidity and rudeness. And the shaman smiled and he looked at him and he said, you know, if you have a cut, go to a doctor. He said, but many human afflictions, those are diseases of the heart, the mind, and the soul. He said, Western medicine can't touch those. With ayahuasca, the magic vine, I cure them. Next slide, please. So this is the famous vine, ayahuasca. When Schultes published this, next. In the Botanical Museum leaflets on a, a hand uh, a hand run printing press in the, ba in, the, in the basement of the Botanical Museum. This is published in 1957 and read by the 15 people in the field. Nobody cared, nobody knew. Well, ayahuasca, as they say, has gone viral. It's used in workshops from Israel to Istanbul. You can buy it on the internet. And proof that ayahuasca has arrived in the published consciousness, the ultimate proof is next. It's now a headline in the onion. So ayahuasca has gone global. And the mainstreaming of ayahuasca into Western medicine, like psilocybe from the mushrooms Schultes found amongst the, the Mazatec in Mexico before anybody knew there were magic mushrooms. The um, stuff that uh, the mescaline from the peyote that Schultes found amongst the Kiowa in Oklahoma. This is now being used by Western doctors to treat so-called incurable diseases, schizophrenia, uh, depression, PTSD. It's now officially being experimented, experimented with and the results are astounding. Does it cure all cases? Of course not. But these were cases long dismissed as incurable. And I wrote about this in the editorial I did for the New York Times uh, this Sunday called The Amazon Can Save Your Life. Next. One of the ways we underbring Schulte's life and times to a broader audience is we produce what we call a storybook map, which as Lauren said, we're debuting a new one tomorrow on our Facebook page as the Amazon Conservation Team Facebook page at noon, free and open to all. Uh, the first one we did was the life and times of Richard Schultes. So you can go to any village you visit in the Amazon, click on the map, there's a picture of the village, there's a picture of Schultes, there's a drop down menu, a list of all the plants he collected, and you can click on the name of every plant and see the actual specimen collected by Schultes in the Harvard Herbarium annotated in his own hand. It's really something. It is a, a, a perfect combination of ancient shamanic wisdom and 21st century technology. Next. 
Another way we've honored his legacy. In 1967, Schultes got the leading lights together, people like Albert Hoffman, the inventor of LSD, the synthesizer of LSD, and they had a meeting about the use of psychoactive plants uh, in Western therapies, which at the time everybody thought was crazy and was a joke. Uh, it turns out that that is something concrete that came out of the Summer of Love, which is revolutionizing Western medicine. These are the proceedings of a, a conference held two years ago to honor Schultes and Hoffman's uh, memory and their foresightedness in terms of realizing that this was going to be an important part of the Western uh, medical armamentarium, and indeed it is. Next. These are just some pages from the Schulte storybook map. As I said, on the left, you see the uh, scientific illustration of Yokel. That is the famous stimulant that, that Schulte's found, found in flower, nobody would have been able to. On the right, another scene from the storybook map, the actual distribution in orange. Next. These are the Kofan Indians. On the left, you see uh, one of Schulte's great photos. He was a fantastic photographer preparing Yokel. And in honor of this photo, I took a picture of a Kofan shaming doing on the right about six or seven years ago. They scraped the bark of the liana into water and they drink it first thing in the morning. It's like coffee, except it's so powerful, you vomit, and then your fingers and toes start tingling, and you can go the whole day without eating or drinking another thing. It's really quite something. Now, some have dismissed this as solely uh, caffeine. But the Indians swear that if you drink this stuff regularly, you don't get malaria. So who knows if this is the next quinine or the next artemis, and it's never been tested in the laboratory. Next. And we have extracts from Schulte's field journals, which I won't get into, because we could spend the whole hour on that. Next. But it just talks about the hardship he went through to be able to find and collect some of these plants and meet some of these shamans. Next. And as I said, there's the actual specimen collected by Schultes, the type specimen. The type specimen is the first specimen of a new species. That's it, in the flesh, or in the leaves, or in the chlorophyll, or in the herbarium. Next. And that's the live plant. And the Indians worship this plant to such a degree. Next. That they asked us to work with them to create the first essentially national park in the Amazon to protect this and other sacred plants this and other medicinal plants. So this is done about 10 years ago and it's thriving still. Next. Now moving east from the Colombian Amazon, this is my work amongst the Anamamo, the, the so-called fierce people, because they don't drink ayahuasca, they take yopo snuff, which is a highly hallucinogenic stuff. Here I am with one of the shamans discussing dosage. And when you take the snuff, it hurts like hell. And then you, you start tripping your brains out. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It's one of the most powerful hallucinogens I've ever done. And in fact, if you're interested more, I'm launching a new podcast next month called Plants of the Gods to talk about my firsthand experience with these peoples and paint the broader picture of how these plants have affected our society. Now, it, 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 it's a common almost a condescending attitude that many Westerners have. The tribal peoples use plants like these to visit the spirit realms and their religion is very much associated with that. But here's a book you should all pick up. It's called The Immortality Key. It came out last week. And it's by a amateur in the best sense of the word. Uh, he's actually a, a, a tax lawyer in DC, but he speaks Greek, ancient Greek and Latin and was able to go back and find that the Eleusinian mysteries were essentially tied to ergot fungus, which was postulated by Gordon Wasson, who was an autodidact ethnomycologist, used to hang out at the Botanical Museum when we were there. And he found goblets from the fourth century, which is right when the Roman Empire started to Christianize. And in those goblets uh, were the remnants of wine, opium, and marijuana. So he postulates that the Eucharist, as originally uh, consumed, was full of active plants. And that yes, people did see Jesus walk on water. And yes, people did see uh, Jesus turn fishes to loaves. 
and that it all had to do with these psychoactive plants. Now, you know, as an ethnobotanist, it makes sense to me. Uh, some people might find that offensive. I, I think it's an interesting theory to, to consider. And you can make the same arguments about Judaism, which is another lecture that we're not going to get into tonight. You can make the same arguments about Islam. But those of you who are interested in, in further information, I, I recommend this book very highly. Next, let's get a few more slides and then open the floor up for some questions. So here we are again with ayahuasca. As I said, Johns Hopkins University just last year set up a, a, a program associated with the medical school to research the use of these shamanic plants in uh, Western healing. Next. This is the Sibandoy Valley where Schultes first collected ayahuasca. As I said, it's the headwaters of the Putumayo River. Next. This is a close up of Salvador Chindoy, the first shaman who taught it to Schultes. Next. This is the famous picture of Schultes learning about plants from Chindoy, as I showed you earlier. Next. And this is the gathering of shamans to honor Schultes' memory, as these people want to protect not just their forests, but their shamanic traditions. We invited shamans from seven different ayahuasca cultures to meet and chart a future for this biocultural conservation metaphor, but protecting the cultures of the rainforest as well. Next. Next. Lawrence, you're still with us there. Another thing that we have focused on the last couple of years is protecting uncontacted tribes. And one of the ways we have done that is setting up guard posts at the mouths of the rivers so that the outside world is kept at bay. So the idea is that uncontacted people can make contact anytime they want, but we want to keep up fundamentalist missionaries, gold miners, and narco traffickers in the meantime. Next. Another uncontacted group from Suriname, dragged out of the forest by the missionaries. 40% of the people were dead within a year. Next. The chief of the tribe, long dead. Next. The tribe that stumbled out of the rainforest in Peru, an uncontacted tribe, they were chased out by narco traffickers burning their lodges and shooting at them. So, when you see this type of contact happening more frequently these days, it's not like these guys decided, okay, life's better on the outside. They didn't have a choice. Next. We set up shaman's apprentice clinics because you can't protect a culture's patrimony, medicinal plant heritage, just by giving them a, a list of plants. They have to be able to practice the medicine. So I started out with the jaguar shaman. That's him treating the apprentice coita that I showed you earlier. Next. That's the opening of the clinic where they're practicing traditional medicine. And we've now set up four clinics like that that have been running for 20 years. That's proof of concept. Anybody can start a cool project in the rainforest, but I set the deadline as 10 years. If it's working 10 years after it starts, that's proof of concept. Six months or a year, not proof of concept. Next. My friend Akoi, the famous poisoner who took 12 years to fess up that he was a shaman, was our lead shaman until he passed away a couple of years ago. Next. And we brought in the Maroons. The Maroons are the descendants of escaped slaves. They were brought to the North Amazon 200 years ago. They got off the slave ships. They said, this was equatorial rainforest. We'll see you white boys later. And they ran off into the jungle and set up their own West African tribal lifestyles in the middle of the Amazon. And this is going to be the focus of our new storybook map launched tomorrow at noon Eastern Standard Time. Go to the Amazon Conservation Team Facebook page and check it out. And this we brought in a maroon healer to learn from the Indians and to teach the Indians. It's real south to south connection and healing. Next. This is how we got started with the map. Once again, as I said, we didn't make the map. We trained them to make the map. Next. And we started in one village in one country, next. And it's now spread to 60 different tribes, map, manage, next. 
and improve protection of over 80 million. It's all in their head before we started the mapping process. Next. We trained park guards, indigenous park guards at these guard posts we put at the mouths of the rivers to keep the outside world at bay. The indigenous people should be deciding who's coming into the lands, not the outside world for a lark or a camera safari or missionary activity. If the Indians want missionaries, you can let them in, but it should be up to the Indians, not the missionaries, not the conservationists for that matter. Next, a mapping expedition. As I said, we've done this now with about 60 tribes. Next. These are the park guards using the maps to decide how to defend their territory. Next. Chiribiquete, which is the beautiful scenery you see behind me. First, essentially discovered by Professor Schultes and expanded into the world's largest rainforest park as a result of a collaborative effort from local indigenous peoples, Colombian scientists, Colombian conservationists, Colombian government, and my own organization, the Amazon Conservation Team. Next. That's what it looks like today. Next. And just to emphasize the continuity, that's me and Yalawifa in 1982 on the left, and that's me and Shaman Yalawifa in February of this year. I was there just before the virus swept in and, and I got out on essentially the last plane out. Next. So this is a famous picture of Professor Schultes that Lawrence and I saw many times where he would show this to his class and say, these are three Indians doing the Kayare dance to keep away the forces of darkness. The one on the right has a Harvard degree. Next slide, please. And when I asked him about this dance, he said, well, it goes on for, for, for two and a half days. And I thought two and a half days, that's like nine to five, nine to five, nine to 12. He said, no, 56 hours straight, next. And each dance, and, and they're, they're, they're about 20 minutes to an hour long, honors a different forest creature, plant, or spirit. This is the butterfly dance. Next. And when I asked him how you keep going for 56 hours, this is the dance of the Tori, the forest spirit. Next. When I asked him how you keep going for 56 hours, next. He said, we take snuff. So, you know, ethnobotanist, the difference between an ethnobotanist and anthropologist, Schulte said, is when the shaman hands you the snuff tube, when the shaman passes you the hallucinogenic brew, the anthropologist says, no, I can't do that. I lose my objectivity. Whereas the ethnobotanist says, yee Next. So they still do the dance. Next. And ethnobotanists still do it with them. Next. Okay. That's the pictures, guys. Who's got a question? Okay. Can okay. you describe a promising okay. example of where an indigenous community secured access to therapeutic compounds? Paul Cox, who was another Schulte student, has done this very successfully uh, with some promising leads, antivirals. You can read about this in my book, Medicine Quest. Every ethnobotanist worth her his salt is concerned about this. Uh, and, and this idea that ethnobotanists and pharmaceutical companies are down there ripping off the Indians is nonsense. Um, that, that happened way too many times in the past, but uh, it doesn't happen anymore. Has de deforestation affected this area? No. The area that we work in is not affected by deforestation. The arc of deforestation is the Southeast Amazon, although now it's spreading rapidly in the Southwest Amazon as well. COVID has killed a lot of indigenous leaders. Um, and uh, how are they dealing with it? Well, I'm, I'm proud to report that our shamans repentance clinics, they reported us because we talked to them every day on what's up. They're using their plants, which they claim are immunostimulants, uh, to keep the virus at bay. And they're looking for plants to cure the virus. So the search continues. Lawrence, you have some questions for me? No, those seem to be some of the questions. Are, um, are there other questions? Please put them in the chat. 
Well, everyone's raising their hand. Well, all right, let's. Uh, I have a question. All right, yeah, so we, we were doing it in the chat box, but let's see if we can keep this in an organized manner. Um, so go ahead, Leslie. Thank you so much, Mark. That was really fascinating. I, I love seeing those pictures. And I have a kind of a off the topic question for you. What were the giant teeth in the necklaces that the medicine men were wearing, if, if you know? Yeah, I know exactly what they are. They're either jaguar teeth or peccary teeth. Peccary is like a rainforest pig. Right. But that's the symbol of the shaman who wears those teeth. And, and that, that's very common in shamanic, uh, shamanic cultures. I mean, even in our own plains in, in Indians, they would wear teeth of, of the, the, you know, the cougar. So another commonality is this idea that the shaman can enter the spirit world of the animal world which is why you see them doing these dances dressed as animals, just like you see the Plains Indians with the buffalo headdress. Do, does the peccary or the jaguar have particular attributes that are recognized by the shaman? Well, the, the, the two most powerful and feared animals are the jaguar and the harpy eagle. The jaguar, because it's the biggest, strongest thing. And I, I mean, people don't realize that a, a big jaguar is essentially the size of a female lion. You know, these, these aren't house cats. And they, they supposedly have a bite stronger than that of a lion. So jaguars roam the jungle at night, which the shamans claim they can do under the influence of ayahuasca. The harpy eagle flies over the forest canopy and looks down and has a view unlike anybody else. And I gotta tell you, I did a, a one of my first ayahuasca ceremonies with a shaman and um, uh, uh, you take a cup and, and the visions come on about 20 minutes later and then you lie down the visions keep coming on and then about three or four in the morning there's sort of a lull and the shaman will or won't invite you to take another cup which i did and then about six or seven in the morning the shaman will invite you over for what they call olympias a cleaning what we call you know energy work where he prays and chants over you and in this olympiasa I, I saw this vision of being a harpy eagle and flying over the forest canopy and looking down and being able to see all and hear all is very, very vivid. And, you know, if you're serious about this stuff, you're not doing it for the show. It's not like, okay, well, I need to like go to the ninth dimension. This sometimes nothing happens and the shame will say you got what you needed out of it. Anyhow, I remember waking up the, the next morning and thinking, wow, that was wild. I've never seen anything like that. You know, this is incredible. Nobody's going to believe it. I'm just going to keep it to myself. And then as I sat up in my hammock, the muscles in my back were sore. And these are muscles that never get sore. It's kind of like when you go skiing at the beginning of the season, those muscles you never use the rest of you are hurting. So these muscles in my back where the wings would have been were very sore. Never forgotten that. Other questions? Mark, there's a bunch in the um, chat box. Do you want me to read them or you want to just read them? Yeah, no, go ahead and read them. All right, so what additional steps can be taken to reduce or end deforestation and loss of indigenous land and species? Well, the most important thing, we say it's three words, map, manage, protect. The first thing is everybody needs to map their lands. All of us who own property have a title to our lands. Many of these places, the Indians don't have title or it's a shaky title. So you need to make sure they have the best maps. It can be as good as a government, ideally better. That's why we say map. Next is manage. A map is not a management plan. It can be seen as an incipient management plan. So everybody needs a management plan. And when I say a management plan, I'm not just talking about non-timber forest products. I'm talking about guard posts. I'm talking about uh, income generating activities. For example, we found 13 stands of Brazil nuts where they weren't supposed to be eating Brazil nuts. They're now harvesting them sustainably. And then protect. And the protection is the hard part. I mean, you find out where the, the borders of your land are, you need to protect your borders. You know, we don't tend to have large plots of land in, in New England where you guys are, or Mid-Atlantic where I am, but these guys live in the middle of a giant rainforest. And so you're not gonna wake up one morning and find loggers cutting down trees on the edge of your land or, or missionaries trying to build a church on the edge of your land. It does happen to these people. So we have helped them establish guard posts around the edges so nobody gets in without them knowing it or wanting it. Next. Do the various tribal shamans cooperate and exchange knowledge? The answer is yes and no. 
it depends because sometimes it's like a competitive advantage. It's like you hang out your shingle. Well, you don't want to tell your secrets to the next guy over. You want more patience. Sometimes we find they're more willing to collaborate with, with shamans from another tribe. Sometimes they're more willing to share their secrets with an ethnobotanist like you or me than they are with another shaman. So, you know, there's about 400 tribes in Amazonia. So it's hard to say, yes, shamans do this or shamans don't do that, or Indians do this or Indians don't do that, because we're talking about a lot of diversity. For example, in the Northeast Amazon, shamans are plant masters, with one or two exceptions, and they use hallucinogenic plants. In the Northwest Amazon, they're ayahuasca masters. They don't use very many medicinal plants by comparison. So when people say, do shamans do this and shamans do that? My question is, well, which shamans? Next. Uh, you sort of answered this with the presentation, but I'll ask it anyway. Are the shamans still able to pass their skills down to the younger generation to sustain their practice? Well, that's the point of the Shaman's Apprentice Program, which was pioneered by the Amazon Conservation Team, because modernity is, is pressing in from all sides. And there's the attraction of the iPhone and the iPad and the internet. Well, we introduce technology in what we think is a culturally sensitive way. You're going to get a GPS and an iPhone, but you're going to get it to map your lands and record grandma's old stories. And what you do in your own time is your own business. But the idea that just giving people technology and you protect the forest of the culture, au contraire. So yes, it can be done, but it's hard. And we have done this as well as, uh, as well as anybody and better than most. And when I say we, I mean the broad we, not we like me and my pals, uh, me and my indigenous pals, not me and, and my ACT cows. It's a collaborative effort. This question gets the award as the best question. Uh, was and I'll let you answer it. Was Schultes particularly tall or are the Amazonians short? Yes to both. So, I mean, you know, forest Indians by and large are not tall people. It's, it's almost like an evolutionary adaptation. You work with Indians in the savannah, they tend to be taller. I mean, it, it sounds sort of Lamarckian, but that, that's my observation. And uh, my brother, who's quite a bit taller than I am, I'm 5'7", I'm said, I know why you want to work in the rainforest, because you can tower over all these guys. Which was a reason I planned on. Other questions? Someone wants to know if it's which I can already answer that myself, but it is to you. Uh, is it okay to share what you've said here uh, on someone's, someone's personal blog? Why don't you answer that and then I'll answer it. Well, I, I think you would say yes, uh, assuming that you're really getting the import of what you're saying and there's plenty of other resources about you and so forth that could be shared on their blog. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, I mean, I'm here to get the message out, so that's fine. I mean, I do have to be more careful than in the old days, in the age of political correctness, that people take things the wrong way. Like I've been told, you shouldn't use the word Indians, it's politically incorrect, but that's what the guys that I work with call themselves. So I don't want to uh, uh, upset anybody, um, but, you know, uh, you can spend a lot of time trying to upset nobody. So my preference is not to do or say anything or be quoted in any way that would upset anybody. But hey, if I said it, I said it. Um, did you learn to look up from time to time to avoid being jumped by a jaguar? <laughs> you got to read my first book to find out the answer to that question. But I will say this, uh, jaguars are smart animals and I don't go in the forest by myself. And that's one of many reasons. And anybody who thinks that jaguars don't attack people doesn't know what they're talking about. So I have a healthy respect for them. Uh, I, 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 I don't live in fear of them, but I don't press my luck by wandering around at night uh, on my own. I mean, I will say this, the Acorio tribe, I showed you that uncontacted tribe that was dragged out of the jungle by the missionaries, where 40% of them uh, died within two years. 30% of male deaths amongst the Akorios was they were killed by jaguars. That's an astonishing figure. And we attribute it to two things. One is they hunted by themselves, which I've never met another tribe with the many I've been with that hunt by themselves, and they didn't have dogs. And so like your mother told you, they're safety in numbers. 
So my advice is don't hunt in the jungle at night by yourself without a hunting dog. Are there any other questions? And Margaret, I didn't know if you actually had a question or were just sharing what you would, what you put on the chat. Let's see, is there another? Um, Lawrence? Sorry to no, do it, but, but no, I did. Yeah, go I, ahead. I did put it in the chat, and you, you oh, all right. skipped all right. over it. I just wondered: in one of the first slides, mm -hmm. you had an arm tattoo that looked yep. very similar to the one that the shaman had, yes. and I wondered: did you do it because it was their custom? Did you do it because you liked it? I mean, what, what, or had a medicinal plant the night before? <laughs> well, that was 1982. And if you remember, the only people who got tattoos in 1982 were sailors. So uh, I wasn't being fashionable. It was very unfashionable. But it's a body dye that they painted on me. It wasn't something I asked for. It was kind of an honor. But it lasts three weeks. So it, it looks just like a tattoo, but fortunately, unlike tattoos, it comes off in three weeks. So it's the best of both worlds. Good question, though. Very observant. Any other questions? Someone asked that said in one of the pictures, there's something that appears to be writing, I guess, by the tribes. And have, have the tribes learned to adopt Western writing techniques and use it? I'm not sure precisely but what it refers to. You but. cut out. Uh, oh. I, the question is, I noticed in one of the pictures the there is writing. Have these tribes learned to adopt Western yeah. writing techniques and use it? Yes. They had no writing. They had no written language. This is really the best thing the missionaries have done, is, is turn their languages into written language. Of course, they turned it into the Bible, and that was the only book they gave them. But these are invaluable skills in the modern world. So yes, all the young guys read and write. And yes, that's 100% learned from the missionaries. There was no written language before the advent of, of Western missionaries. And one person wants to know, I'm interested in the languages you have encountered and how, I'm not quite sure what this is, how they were, uh, how they were learned. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I, you know, back when you and I were in school, Lawrence, they weren't teaching tribal languages. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm a a baby boomer. I mean, I was always taught if you want to communicate with foreigners, just speak louder, right? I didn't, I grew up in a unilingual lingual household. I didn't learn my second language until 26, which I had to because my girlfriend was Costa Rican. So I don't want to give the idea that, you know, I just swing in a place and pick up a tribal language in, in a few weeks. There are people that can do that. I'm not one of them. But uh, the great thing about the Northeast Amazon is there's a trading language. Like I said, it's a combination of Amerindian, Portuguese, Dutch, and Yiddish. And it's very easy to learn. I'm, I'm quite fluent in it. I'm, it's better, I speak it better than I speak English. And I was working with this one YY guy for three years. And I learned a little bit of YY, but mostly we're speaking this tribal trading language. So I don't know. And at the end of three years, I was working on one particular plant. I couldn't get the recipe down. You, you boil the plant and then you burn it, or you burn the plant and then you boil it. And he turned to me and said, in perfect English, you burn the plant and then you boil it. I've been working with him for three years, not, un, not knowing that he spoke English as well as anybody on this session. And I was flabbergasted. And I asked him, he said, well, I'm a YY. I, I grew up in British Guiana. I went to mission school. Of course I speak English. He never asked. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask. Two more questions. I know Mark's got to go. So we'll yep. do these two more questions. Um, this one says, just like there are many different shamans with different practices, the Amazon is huge. And how can one speak for the entire Amazon, especially given the majority of the land is in Brazil? Yeah, well, that's the point I made. There's many tribes, as many cultures, as many countries. Americans tend to associate the Amazon with Brazil. Brazil is 66%. I've done much of my work outside Brazil for a variety of reasons. So yeah, I'm, I always, you know, preface, preface what I say is like, I'm not speaking for all these people. I even work with 400 tribes. I haven't worked in all nine Amazonian countries. I'm just talking from my personal experience. So that's a, that's a legit question or even criticism. But, you know, you gotta get the word out. And that's the point of the new book 
by the Amazon, what everybody needs to know to, to collate what I knew and bring together what other people know. So there would be a, a sort of go-to book. But prior to that, there wasn't. And the idea is to bring together stuff that's scientifically accurate uh, in a readable fashion. Because scientists are taught to write for other scientists. And typically, there's really only seven other people in your field and three of them are your friends and four of them hate your guts. And, and you spend decades squabbling. So I wasn't interested in, in, in writing for that audience first and foremost, and that's why I've done a number of popular books. So the first book I did is Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice, and the last book I did is The Amazon, and I use this to teach a course, and I assign both of them. And my, the, my favorite student said, with these books, you get to look at Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice, and you look down on the canopy with the new book, and that's the best perspective you can have. So I've, I've thrown out a lot of ideas and names and stuff. The best place to find all this stuff is my personal webpage, markplotkin.com. Uh, the best place to go for the uh, environmental activism and activities that I talked about, like the mapping of the uh, Putumayo uh, headwaters, is amazonteam.org. Uh, we're always looking for financial support of the Amazon conservation team because of this terrible COVID crisis in the Amazon. Last six months, we put 35 tons 35 tons of uh, medical and sanitary supplies into the hands of various tribes, but we still need more uh, money to, to do more of this. So donating to us is a tax deductible donation, amazonteam.org, you can do it on our website. And I'll, I'll, I'll close with the last and most important point, and that is this. The world's in terrible shape, the Amazon's in terrible shape, our political landscape's in terrible shape. Here's something to consider. Environmentalism, which is invented in this country, was invented by the Republican Party. Clean air, clean water, endangered species never was a political issue before. It was a bipartisan issue. It needs to be that way again. Not only was the greatest president we ever had a Republican, Teddy Roosevelt, the second greatest environmental president we ever had was a Republican, Richard Nixon, the Marine Mammal Act, the Endangered Species Act. Now, Joe Biden has made several pronouncements about protecting the Amazon, the importance of it, un, unsolicited. And I would rather hear uh, the Republicans say something positive about this rather than say, oh, okay, the Democrats have all the answers because they don't, we don't. But the reason that's important is that the president of Brazil, who's a hugely destructive force, and don't quote that on a blog, it get my life threatened, is really a destructive force in Amazon. He makes no bones about it. He calls himself Mr. Chinsaw, and he's very connected to this administration. So if we have a change of administrations here, I expect we'll see a change of administrations there. The lesson here, everybody's got to vote. And I'm not telling you who to vote for. I know my New England community well. I know who most of you are going to vote for. But we've got to make our voices heard. And I'm 65. This is the most crucial election in my lifetime. And, you know, if you don't like the way things are going, vote. Uh, if you don't vote and things get worse, it's your fault. So vote, make sure your family and friends vote. And if you have friends who are voting for the wrong party, change their mind. And if they don't change their mind, don't give them a ride to the polls. Thank you very much. Hey, Mark, one more question because it's so good. Um, and I know probably close to both our hearts. Do you have any suggestions for how students could get involved in this type of work? Very straightforward. There's a great book written by Gary Nabhan called Ethnobotany Today or something like that. It came out about three years ago. And he does this soul searching essay about is there a future for ethnobotany in the age of deforestation, COVID? acculturation? And the answer is a resounding yes. But if you're going to be an ethnobotanist, go in with your eyes open. Go in with an idea and a determination to help these people protect their culture, help them protect their forest, their desert, their, their arctic lands, because you, you will be uniquely qualified to do so, because unlike many scientists, you'll go there with an open mind and an open heart, and you'll have the scientific training to help these people deal with the outside world on their own terms. So the point is not to go there and tell me what never works, but to be able to help them deal with the outside world on their own terms. 
So when people approach me about a career in ethnobotany, you know, the old model used to be get your college degree, get your master's, get your PhD. I don't buy that. Okay. If you want to make a career as a scientist, by all means, get a PhD. But if you want to be an ethnobotanist and you want to get your ass out in the field and you want to make a difference, it's a better investment of time and money to do a joint master's. You can do that in three years. And ethnobotanists tend to fall into two groups. Those that prefer the botanical angle, those that prefer the anthropological angle. So my recommendation is to get a joint master's, you know, a master's in botany or a master's in anthropology married to something else. Could be water quality, could be chemistry. A very powerful combination is to get it with an MBA or an MPA, which gives you management expertise. And so the idea that the great days of ethnobotany are all behind us, not true. And if you read the piece I wrote for the New York Times on Sunday, it's on my webpage, you'll see that we're still finding incredible new stuff. You see that my buddy Glenn Shepard just found out what Piri Piri was, which people had tried to figure out for years. It's a sedge, it's a chemically inert plant, but Glenn, after years of living with the indigenous peoples, found out Yes, it is a sedge, but it's a sedge invaded by a hallucinogenic fungus. And that fungus is the same one that's related to what Albert Hoffman was studying when he came up with LSD. It's the same one related to the same stuff that was found last week in the bottom of those chalices, which this fellow believes was the invention and creation of Christianity. So is ethnobotany still relevant? You bet your ass. Is ethnobotany still important in a world where we don't have a cure for COVID or a cure for drug-resistant bacteria or a cure for drug-resistant malaria? I say ethnobotany is more important than ever before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Remember to vote. Thank you. Good night.